welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. I'm Alan McDaniel, and I want to welcome you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're continuing on in our study of prayer, a very, very important topic indeed, without doubt. Uh, everything in our relationship with God is based on conversation with Him, communication with Him. And first of all, of course, the communication starts with Him. We uh, are saved because he called us, called us by name. But all of our conversation is like that, and it, it should kind of come from him. So we've done uh, two studies now on prayer, and we've talked about the power of prayer that God desires should be in our life, and we have talked about God being our Father. So it's not like you're going to the government to ask for something, It's not like you're going to a king to ask for something, a worldly king, but you're going to your father in communication. That's why we've entitled this series, Communications, no, Conversations with My Father. Uh, It's not only a good title, it's a good thing to do, Conversations with My Father. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, because you could have no relationship with God the Father, save for the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So as I say, last week we were talking about what it means that the prayer that Jesus taught us as a model for prayer for the church, which we call the Our Father, or erroneously the Lord's Prayer, which it is not, his prayer was very simple. Not my will, but thy will be done. So it starts, though, with the fact that Jesus has made a way. He has united us with the Father. And your relationship with your Father is different than your relationship with a boss at work or with the government, or with any other, any other human being. Uh, that's why we can cry out, as Paul said, Abba, Abba Father. So we talked about that last week, but today we're going to start by talking about the next thing that Jesus said in that model. He said, Our Father, hallowed be thy name, because it is about the name of the Lord God Almighty that we pray. But before we do that, you know what? I'm going to pray because I'm going to ask, Father, that you would use this time in my life and in the life of everybody watching this, Lord God, to draw us closer and closer to you. Because that is our great desire. That is our great need is just a closer walk with thee, just to come closer and closer to grow in you, to be renewed, transformed by the renewing of our mind. So, Lord, I pray that this time in the study in your word would change us, Lord God. Would, would bring us from glory to glory, would make us more and more like your son, Christ Jesus. That's my prayer, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hallowed be thy name. You know, um, I had the opportunity many years ago, I was asked by a church to come in and, and teach teenagers about this prayer. I, I think what they wanted was that I come in and just teach them to memorize it and say it by rote which is exactly what the Lord said not to do in the Sermon on the Mount. So when I got there and I started to explain these things to them, they had no concept of what, what does it mean, hallowed be thy name. And the question becomes is, do you know what it means, hallowed be thy name? Because most, most people I ask, really, they have vague ideas, but it's about blessing his name. His name is holy. His name is awesome. Okay? And we have to go before him in that name. So we'll start because I said that prayer is most important as we listen to God. It's not us going to talk to God. Prayer is about us going to talk with God, all right? In Leviticus 22, verses 32 and 33, it says, You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be sanctified among the sons of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. God is holy. His name is holy. And he sanctifies us. He is making us holy. You know, Peter said that we are to be holy even as he is holy. That is the name above all names. The only name given by which men can be saved is the name of Jesus. Um, The Jews pray. They, They take this very seriously that the name of God is to be revered. So much so that I, I believe that it can lead into a, a wrong approach to his name. They don't believe that his name, 
Orthodox Jews, many conservative Jews, they just don't believe that the name of the Lord should be named because it's too holy. And the, the possibility exists that you'll use it in vain, which God commanded us not to. So, for example, when, they, when, they're, when they're printing, they won't even use the word, they won't print the word God, G-O-D. They will print G hyphen D. And they will often say in their prayers, Baruch Hashem, which means blessed be the name. Well, praise God for that. Uh, his name is, to, is blessed and to be blessed. In Ezekiel 39, 7, God said this, spoke this through the prophet. My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. And I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. God has entrusted us with name. You know, there's a power in knowing somebody's name. I said that, you know, I grew up in, in New York City, in Manhattan. And if you have any idea, it's like just streets. It's absolutely crowded with people. And if you, if you holler, hey, you, you know what? In New York City, nobody's going to turn and look. But if you call out, hey, John, you know what? Everybody that's named John is going to turn around and look. There's, there is that power to get somebody's attention by knowing their name, all right? Moses, for example, when he stood on that holy ground at the burning bush, and by the way, it wasn't the bush that was holy, and the only reason that the ground was holy was because of the presence of the Lord God. God's presence makes something holy. Oh, wow, gosh, that's pretty cool, considering that we are the temple of the living God. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. There is holiness in us, all right? So he has made his name known because Moses said he was not going to go into the land of Egypt, as God was telling him to do, unless he knew the name. So the Lord revealed his name, and his, he said his name is I am that I am. You know what? You am not. Every one of us human beings here, we exist because of somebody else's action, because of what my mother and father did. My mother and father were responsible for giving me, bringing me into this world. God has no, no source. He is the source. He is all the source. So we owe our existence to our parents, but now, having been born again, we owe our existence to God the Father. We owe our existence to Jesus Christ. God has entrusted us, as I said, with his name. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. That's Psalm 91, verses 14 and 15. We have to come to this place where we understand that prayer, our prayer life, is not about saying words by rote. It's about talking with. It's a personal conversation. Now, I, I think when we started this study, we talked about the different kinds of prayer. And the different kinds of prayer where there's individual prayer, where, you know, you go off to your prayer closet or you go off someplace to be by yourself and pray. But then there's a time that there's corporate prayer when we come together and join in prayer in which there's incredible power in that, in our unity. Um, that's why this prayer starts our Father. The problem is we don't have the unity that we're supposed to in the body of Christ. And that may be, that may be tremendously affecting the prayer life of the church. And we need to consider that it's prayer is starts, it is founded on God's will. You want a power-filled prayer life? It's, it's so, if you understand the instruction of God, God spoke through John in the first letter of John, and he said, this is the confidence that we have, that if we ask anything of him, anything in his will, we know that he hears us. If God hears us, if we have that assurance that he hears us, he's going to answer. If it's in his will, all right? We're praying according to his will. How do you know what his will is? He tells you. You know, we go into prayer. One of the things we should come away from prayer in is knowing his will, knowing what he wants for us individually in our lives. We're, we, we've been given the word so we know what the, you know, the, what the church is supposed to be doing, what the body of Christ is supposed to be doing. But you need to have personal direction that comes from the Holy Spirit. Because those who are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. That's why we can call him Abba, all right? With our earthly father, there are times when we might call him Daddy. 
There are times when we might call him father out of respect and honor to him. But it doesn't change that loving, trusting relationship, does it? Calling on Abba Father shows the childlike, trusting, loving relationship with him. Calling on Father shows the respect and awe of who he is and his power. As I said, knowing the name of someone gives you power to get their attention. And think of the very the second commandment. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Exodus 27. I am not a fan of the government school system in this country, nor in England, nor in most of the places that I've gone around the world. One of the reasons being, here in the United States of America, it is basically a crime to mention the name of Jesus Christ in a school setting, because that breaks those laws. Of course, that doesn't mean you're not allowed to do it if you're cursing. Because if you're cursing, well, then the government will defend your right of free speech. How upside down is that? Think about what Isaiah said in chapter 5. He said, you know, what are those who call evil good and good evil? If that's not an example of that, that we have allowed the name of Jesus Christ to become one of the most common curses used in the world. Please be on guard. Be on guard. God has entrusted you with his name. Hold it holy. Then Jesus said, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Is our prayer to say to the Lord, thy kingdom come? I mean, are we really wanting that time to come? I rejoice, you know, uh, even so, come Lord Jesus. That should be our prayer. But I think too many of us are so wrapped up in the world and the things of the world that it's like, okay, yes, Lord, we want you to come. But where do I get that new job? Where do I get that new home? Where do I get that new car? Where do I get, you know, where, where, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, don't get entangled in the affairs. No soldier on active duty gets entangled in the affairs of every day life. Don't get entangled with the world. So in reality, down in your heart, you're not really ready for Christ to come back because he'll interrupt your plans. When if you understood the will of God and you understood the grace of God, the mercy and the love of God, like Paul did, so he could say to live as Christ, to die is gain, that it would be our great passionate desire for Jesus to show up right now, that we would hear hoofbeats in the sky and hear that trumpet blow. So yes, we want to be praying in agreement with God. I mean, that, this, is, this is the key to everything. You know, as I mentioned in the beginning here, that the confidence we have is we ask anything according to his will. That means that we're in agreement with him. If you pray prayers that are not in agreement with him, oh, Lord forbid, that's a, the worst thing that can happen is that he answers your prayer. I mean, isn't that exactly what happened with the, with the Jewish people when they came to the prophet Samuel back in Ramah and said, give us a king that we might be like the other nations? And the Lord granted them their, their desire, their wish. But he told them, here's the way it'll be. And it'll be terror. It'll be, you want to know something? Go look at that in, in 2 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel, and see... The answer is, that's how politics in the, uh, I just, it frustrates me so much to think of, you know, we, we ask for things and then get them and then are horrified by the results because we haven't sought his will to know what he desires for us. Because he, you know, what, is, what does he desire for us? He came that we may have life and have it abundantly. That's, he came that we would have that joy that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, that we'd have that peace that's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. How do we get there? By walking according to his will. You know, I said this last week, I think, that if we're not walking in the word, we're walking away from the word. Well, King Solomon, okay, I mean, one of the great examples of prayer in God's will. In 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, he said, Your servant is in the midst of your people which you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be number or counter, counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? He prayed that God would equip him, give him what he needed to serve the people of God. And then it goes on to say in verse 10, it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, 
nor have asked for riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. Think about what Paul wrote to the, to the church in Ephesus, the Ephesians, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. God wants to do more for us than we can even imagine. Abundant life, but abundance. He said, even when a man has abundance, his life doesn't consist of his possessions. It's not about stuff. So Solomon paid to pray this great prayer, and God gave him a great answer. And yet, later in Solomon's life, I'll tell you what was great. Great was his fall. In Ecclesiastes 2.15, Solomon said, Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. He forgot why God had given him the gift. And the entire focus of his life, originally set on God's kingdom, now shifted to building his own kingdom. God said, because you didn't ask this for yourself or this for yourself. But think about it and go read the second chapter of Ecclesiastes. And pastors, I beg you to stop and read this and think about it. Because we don't want to be building our own little kingdoms. Solomon said, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. I made ponds of water for myself. I bought male and female slaves. I collected for myself silver and gold and treasure. So he had prayed with a good heart, but somewhere, maybe because of his seven his hundreds of wives and porcupines or concubines, as the case may be, he went astray with his foreign wives. Effective prayer places the focus on his kingdom, not on ours. Solomon is the perfect, or I should say imperfect, example of burnout in ministry. He said that he hated the work of his hands. Do you, If you want, I mean, a fulfilled life, find God's will. Get God's will. He'll, he'll tell you. Go ask him. That's prayer. Because he wants to bless you. That's what he desires. We don't have to go in prayer to try and convince God to be good to us. How ridiculous is that when you stop and think about it? And then he says in this prayer, right? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, again, listen to God. Prayer is about listening to God. Listen to what he says. In Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding today, for your good. The commandments of God are for your good. It's got to be according to his will. So Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 12, 2, and he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Peter, same thing. Peter and Paul, I mean, they're always, they're, they're in agreement. Peter says, for such is the will of God that by doing right, you might silence the ignorance of foolish men. You've got to know the will of God. How do you know the will of God? He'll tell you. It's written in his word. And when you go talk to him, he'll tell you. Here is the Lord's Prayer. Okay? The Lord's Prayer is not in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. That's the prayer for the church. Here's the Lord's Prayer. And he, Jesus, withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet... Not my will, but thy will be done. 
Like I said, this assumes, you know, you assume that you know God's will. It is the key to an effective, vital, and power-filled prayer life. I've, I've said this, I think, a couple times already. I was, I'm going to read it this time. 1 John 5, 14 says, This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. God desires, he greatly desires, and he has proven it with his son, Jesus Christ, to bless us, to give us life and life abundantly. Okay. So then he says, give us this day our daily bread. Now I have to ask you a question. Now listen, listen again. Prayer is about listening to God. Listen to God. Deuteronomy 8.3. He's speaking to his people and he said, he humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. His word. That's what Jesus said when he was being tempted in the wilderness, right? Psalm 34, 10, it says, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. See, we've got to focus on our relationship with the Father and about our prayers, because our prayers should be confessing his superiority, his glory, his holiness, his kingdom, and his will. I, I just said it a minute ago. I'm going, to, I'm going to say it over and over. It doesn't hurt me again to say it. Prayer is not about convincing the Lord to provide for our needs. He's already given us an assurance of that, right? Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, because my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. David, I mean, a thousand years before the birth of Christ, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Our needs are basic. Our needs are basic. Daily bread. What do you need more than that? I mean, you know, you, you have to have food. Well, there's spiritual food and there's natural food, but God will supply both, right? We don't need to be focused on the material things because we have the assurance of his love for us. We have assurance of his faithfulness to provide for our needs. We only need to trust him for our daily needs, not to try and convince him to give them to us. Sometimes our, our prayers confess our lack of faith. And I, I think it's, uh, it's important here to understand that give us this day our daily bread. It's not to convince God to give us bread. It's to convince us that God supplies our daily bread, that he is the source of our needs because we become so easily convinced, you know, I go to work and I earn money, I got a paycheck and I go down to the grocery store, I buy it, that we are the source. We're not, we're not. He is the source. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do if we come to that time and that time is coming when you'll not be able to buy nor sell without the mark of the beast? How are you gonna go to the grocery store and buy your bread then? Well, you have a choice. You can, you can give in to Satan or you can trust in the Lord, who's been supplying your daily bread since the day you were born again. We need to, this prayer, we need to look at this as this is our training to be walking in faith. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you go into prayer and you hear from God, that's going to build your faith. When you pray, give us this day our daily bread. You are confessing that you know that that bread comes from him. You didn't do it. And then nobody can take anything away from you. They don't make it impossible for, because I can't get to God. And God, God is supreme. He is superior. He is holy. He is faithful. It depends on what you, want, what you want. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. We live in a world that is determined to make you malcontent, to make you discontent. Uh, you know, every if you put on the television, you're going to see 
commercials, adverts from my brothers and sisters in the UK. You're going to watch the telly and see those adverts, one after another, one after another one, and they are trying to make you malcontent. You're not going to buy a new car unless they can convince you that you're, you don't need that, that old car is not suitable for you. No, maybe that old car isn't, but by and large, people don't replace cars because they need to. They buy new cars because they have been, they have been bedazzled by all of the stuff that's now offered. The world, which is in the power of the evil one, that's what it says in 1 John 5, 19, right? Is working day and night to build discontentment within our lives. And as long as you're discontent, you, you will not have joy. You will not have peace. You'll be anxious. And by the way, there's a great big difference between joy and happiness. Okay? Happiness is momentary based on your circumstance. Joy is something that God has given you. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit regardless of the circumstances in your life. God wants you filled with that joy. And know what John the Baptist said? His joy came from hearing the voice of the bridegroom, hearing the voice of the Lord. You can hear the voice of the Lord when you get into the Word. You can hear the voice of the Lord when you do Bible studies. You can hear the voice of the Lord, but you should be able to hear it clearly when you're in conversation with God, when you're praying. Genesis 25, 8, it says, Adam, Abraham, Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age an old man and satisfied. King James is full. And he was gathered to his people. How many people do you know in this world that are satisfied? The Rolling Stones, they've been around for, I'm, I'm going to give or take, about 100 years, it seems like. And they're still out singing. And I think their biggest hit was, I can't get no satisfaction. Well, brother, I want to tell you something out there. I'm satisfied. I am satisfied. The only, thing, the only thing that I want, and I want my prayer life to be, is I want a closer walk with Him. So, Father, we do. We praise You. And I come before You right now, and I desire, I desire to be closer and closer to You. Because I know Your promise. I know Your promise. That if we seek You and Your kingdom, all the rest shall be added unto us. All, everything that we need, Lord God. Lord, help us to be more than satisfied with Your abundant love for us. In Jesus' name. Well, until next week, the Lord bless you and goodbye. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mind.